Um, traditionally, nickel catalysts uh, haven't been very successful because of their coking problems. But in this paper, you'll see some work where we've made some improvements there. And once you have coking, of course, you're going to have deactivation and the catalyst uh, fuzzing the reactor. So that can be a major problem. The uh, reaction network is pretty complex. You have, first of all, your um, oxidation studies going on. Your, uh, Preferably, you want the first reaction to occur with CO and hydrogen, but what will happen is you will generate CO2 and also water. And these reactions are uh, more exothermic than the desired reaction. Then once forming the water and the CO2, in situ you can have reforming going on and water gas shift chemistry going on. Plus, you can have your product undergo oxidation during the process. So even though the problem looks simple, the uh, kinetics and reaction network are complex. And you still have to worry about carbon formation. Your methane can decompose. You can have the water reaction, the CO2 proportionation, and your uh, syngas reaction itself. The products can react with one another. And you would like to minimize that chemistry. Uh, Historically, DuPont has had a long record of doing millisecond contact time catalysis uh, with their high HCN technology uh, using a platinum rhodium catalyst. So they're very skilled in this area. And uh, also another well-known process for making nitric acid, the Oswald process, uh, making methanol from formaldehyde. All of these are short contact time uh, commercial entities. And uh, the trick here is that you um, control your kinetics so that you stop at product B without undergoing secondary reactions to the undesirable product C. So you want to have the optimal residence time, operate at high velocities. You have the benefit of mass transfer uh, uh, becomes less important. Also, your homogeneous reactions become less important. So you control your selectivity. So you get high conversion, high selectivity. Uh, you have a high throughput rate, which means you can minimize your reactor size. And from an engineering standpoint, you can handle the heat generated and eliminate thermal runaways. On the research scale, we do this on a very small reactor shown here. Basically, it's the quartz tube reactor all this work is done under 5 ESIG with our feed mantle shown here, our online gas chromatograph, and then we have a propane um, burner to power, uh, burn all of your syngas product at the end. And the reactor is a uh, simple quartz tube, as I mentioned. And we packed alumina be beads in there to give you a uh, good mixing of your feed. And uh, to preheat your feed coming in, your catalyst will be right here, be either a powder or a monolith. And then below you have a cooling coil to uh, minimize, to maintain your selectivity. And then it's analyzed by a gas schematograph. And schematically, a little easier to see what's happening here. Uh, you preheat in this zone with your, and uh, pre-mix your feed, monitor your temperatures. Sandwich your uh, monolith in between two heat shields, and then monitor your exit temperatures. You want to cool down as quickly as possible below the uh, heat shield. And all of this is uh, PLC controlled so that you can safely run a unit like this. Um, you can choose your hydrocarbon, whether it be methane, ethane, or propane. The work today you're hearing about is methane. Um, so that if you have an over temperature, over pressure phenomenon, the system will safely uh, shut down and purge. Okay. Well, people might wonder, well, why do you want to look at a nickel catalyst? Well, certainly it would be uh, less expensive than a group A metal catalyst. And there's been a lot of publications by Schmidt and 
Marilyn Hoff using rhodium. So we were looking for uh, economic savings, and we knew that nickel by itself would probably generate lots of coke. So we went into the literature and found many publications by um, some people using nickel in an MGO matrix. And this catalyst would perform well for a number of hours before coping would occur. So this seemed to be a very good lead, and this is the work of Wittgenstein and Coop. So we thought, well, why, why not think of promoters that would maintain the life a little bit longer? And we found a number of uh, promoters which we patent, have patent coverage on now, basically giving you uh, methane conversion in the 90s, quantitative uh, oxygen conversion, high selectivity of syngas. So we're able to maintain our um, desired yield conversion selectivity. And as you'll see with the analytical, very little coke, meaning therefore you have good catalyst life. And we have freedom to operate in a legal sense. We also get the uh, syngas ratio that we want. We can run at a two to one ratio of methane to oxygen. We don't have to feed in extra oxygen uh, as one would have to do with if you were using rhodium. Catalyst. And the catalyst likes to run cooler instead of being up around 1100 degrees C with the weight metal at the millisecond contact time, we're well below uh, 900. And again, that would translate into a, a capital savings. Um, so, comparative data shown here if we have no promoter present, our conversion selectivities are fairly low, but adding in Motors of manganese, molybdenum, and tungsten were able to achieve numbers in the 90s. And you'll see that we were not able to measure any technical coke by TGA analysis. We also did a uh, XRD analysis of uh, the unpromoted catalyst. This is unpromoted. And you can see fresh being A versus used being B seeing some of the nickel metal phase grow in. So with use, you are reducing the nickel plus two to nickel zero, which is not what you want. Whereas with the uh, promoted catalyst with the manganese now shown here, your fresh and your spent look very similar. You can see maybe a hint of the uh, nickel metal pattern coming in. Again, though, we could not quantify the coke with uh, TGA. Here's the unpromoted catalyst after use. No promoter here. And you can see the nickel particles showing up, uh, roughly 10 to even 50 nanometers in diameter. These particles uh, become humongous. Basically, they come out of the uh, solid solution of the nickel MGO and precipitate on the surface. With the uh, promoter there, with the manganese, we're seeing, you don't, you no longer can see these nickel particles uh, sweating out of the MGO solution. It all looks relatively even, and you can't really see much carbon either. Um, if you find a little carbon there, you can't really associate it with the nickel particle, per se. Whereas the uh, other catalyst that we saw earlier, if you look carefully, you can see that there's carbostratic carbon, turbostratic carbon building up around the nickel particles. And of course, you can quantify that carbon by TGA. So we also did some uh, XAPS work and uh, Zane's characterization, because here we can quantify the uh, oxidation state of nickel plus two versus nickel zero, and know the extent of reduction. So we thought this would be a nice way to couple our uh, analytical with the XRD that we looked at earlier. And we found that um, without a promoter, yes, you do see some reduction of your nickel plus two to nickel zero, whereas with the dopant, uh, this is not necessarily the case. And the uh, spectra are shown here. And it's probably easier to look at this section here. The dark lower blue curve is a fresh catalyst with the manganese promoter in there. And after it's been used in syngas production, 
the red line curves on that spectra, and it's showing you that there's 0.6% uh, of the uh, nickel in the catalyst becomes reduced. Whereas the unpromoted catalyst, <coughs> even before you do syn gas, you already have 16% nickel metal, and you might wonder why is that? Well, after you've uh, synthesized your catalyst, you have to do a hydrogen uh, pre-reduction step to get, give it any activity. And that's true even with the promoted uh, catalyst. Yeah, we pass it hydrogen over at 800 degrees C. So already the nickel has undergone reduction, and your um, after use, 44% of the nickel exists by the nickel zero. So, um, which is in line with the huge nickel particles that we're seeing. So taking the uh, Zane's work and doing uh, some modeling with Sirius by um, molecular simulations, and this is fuzzy, but anyway, the uh, blue uh, circle or spheres here are the nickel metal, and the red are the magnesium, and the uh, magenta is your uh, oxygen. Basically, what it's saying is to get a pattern that theoretically matches that, what you obtain experimentally, your nickel is fairly well dispersed as a solid solution as uh, nickel plus two prior to use. And um, so there's some order uh, or pattern there. So uh, basically, in summary, um, we've achieved high methane conversion and so gas selectivity with the nickel MGO catalyst. And performance improved with the addition of motors, and uh, primarily manganese is what you've, uh, you've shown so far. Um, we've minimized code formation uh, basically by inhibiting the nickel metal precipitation from the solid solution. So the role of the uh, manganese promoter is to minimize that phenomenon, and we have some speculation about the mechanism there. Uh, basically, the uh, Zane data that we have is really convincing that the fresh catalyst, uh, primarily with the promoter, all of these are in solid solution with one another, and uh, we're, stable, we're able to stabilize nickel in the plus two state. Um, I didn't have time to really delve into it too much, but we have taken the powdered catalyst and put it into a three-dimensional form, which would be more useful from a commercial standpoint, and we have uh, generated some data there to give the catalyst height. And I'd like to acknowledge all the co-workers and uh, Roger Song did a lot of catalyst preparation work. Bob Oswald uh, ran the reactor for us. Uh, Jorge Muniz was our summer student who um, was very helpful, came up with some of the initial preps that we uh, focused in on. Uh, Bill Holstein, catalyst characterization. Schaefer Supermani did the uh, TEM work, and Dave Rosenfeld did the uh, x and Zane work for us. And uh, thank you for your attention. What do you mean by 99% or so selectivity of methane conversion? Uh, Does that make just CO? Right. You're uh, basically, that's your, based on your carbon selectivity, uh, methane. Right, you're hardly making any CO2. You don't make any other higher oxygenates. That's right. So it's, it's very clean. Sorry, I missed the first few minutes. What was the methane to oxygen ratio? That was 200. So feeding in 60% uh, <coughs> methane, 30% oxygen, and then 10% nitrogen. Are you trying to pulse that you put in the oxygen first and then put in the methane separate from the oxygen? Uh, no, I didn't do that. That could be interesting. Yeah. But I would need uh, in check methane, I would check uh, oxygen but on, on uh, some levels. Oh, storage it in. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, yeah that would and be it's a list with different activities. Right.
question. I, I really don't have a handle on that, but my speculation, I think a lot of the chemistry is um, solid state chemistry going on. And, and even with a promoter, you probably only need a little bit of the nickel and zero, and that's really the uh, catalytic site. But that um, with a promoter, perhaps we're not allowing it to uh, come together with a lot of nickel particles. Um, and maybe what manganese oxide is doing is until helping to keep that nickel surface clean. So if there's any carbon forming, it might be able to shuttle some oxygen over to the carbon and clean that surface off. But that's totally stuff with it. Okay, two short questions coming up. So color of the solid solution, nickel oxide uh, in MGO, it's, if it's so incredible, it should be green. If it's exposed to oxygen and nickel changes the valence state to nickel partially nickel free, it should get black. Uh, if it's cold, it should get black too. <laughs> so, uh, what, uh, what what is the actually the color of the spent catalyst? Right. Um. Yes. Uh, the fresh catalyst is kind of a khaki green. So that would be in agreement with what you're saying. And then if, if it were promoted catalyst, it would stay that color. The unpromoted will get darker, and in some cases, if you do see carbon deposits. That's a short question. No? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.